So yeah, I'm presenting the introduction to object-oriented programming in the um, chapter 12. I don't know why. Oh, I forgot to delete the S. <laughs> okay, so these slides are adapted from cohort one and three, I think, Darren Ram Ramsden and Megan Stodel. So object-oriented programming is a tautology where we say object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm centered around objects. Um, what is an object? Objects are collections of data and methods. Every object has a type, which we call class, and the class of the object determines its attributes and how you can interact with the object. The key idea is the nature of the object tells you how you can interact with the object, um, i.e. what functions you can use. Don't know what she's working at, okay. Um, there was a glossary in the introduction. And so just go over them briefly. So we have polymorphism is where a developer can consider a function's interface separately from its implementation. So we can have the same function form be used for different types of outputs um, or objects. Encapsulation where the user doesn't need to worry about an object's details because they are encapsulated behind a standard interface. Class is the type of the object. Method is an implementation for a specific class. Fields defined by the class um, is data possessed by all instances of that class. And then method dispatch, the process of finding the correct method for a given class. So what makes object-oriented programming useful? The main reason is that first definition, the polymorphism. So polymorphism allows developers to, to think about a function's interface separately from the actual um, method. So an example is the summary function. So summary looks the same to every user, but can provide different um, behavior depending on the type. So example is if we do summary on something that's numeric, we get a five number summary. If we do a summary on, um, I think this is a factor, we get a frequency table. So this is more flexible than an if else statement um, because any developer can extend the interface, which is just that summary function. And then it's simple for the user. They don't have to write the if else themselves. Um, okay. Or they you know, just use one function, no matter what the type is. So what's the deal with object-oriented programming in R? It's complicated mostly because there are many ways to do it. There are multiple systems and there's three in the book. Um, the next chapter that we might do today is the S3. The different systems are not objectively set in relative importance. So different communities use different systems. S3 and S4 use generic function, object-oriented programming rather than encapsulated, um, which is more common in other languages. So it's hard to transfer existing not skills to R. Okay, so the three functions that are focused, sorry, not the functions, the three systems focused on in the book are S3, which is used throughout base R. Um, functions can return rich results with user-friendly display and programmer-friendly internals. It's generally the simplest. R6 offers a way to escape copy on modify. It's important if you model objects that exist independently of R, for example, data from an API. And then S4 is a rigorous system that's useful if you um, are collaborating across multiple contributors and offers more guarantees and greater encapsulation than S3, but it's more work upfront. Um, I personally have used S4 a little bit in spatial data analysis. Um, and that's, I, I don't know much about R6. <laughs> okay, what's meant by an object-oriented programming system is a collection of language features that allow one to program in an object-oriented fashion. Um, this whole separation of the user and the programmer throughout this 
chapter was a little confusing for me because I generally think about coding as just me doing work for myself. <laughs> so it was a little bit confusing. Um, so the two paradigms in the among those systems mentioned are the encapsulated, where um, the methods that belong to objects are, or sorry, the object encapsul encapsulates both the data and the behavior. Whereas the, the functional object oriented programming has methods that belong to generic functions. From the outside, it looks like a regular function call and internally the components are also functions. So I believe this is the S3 is the functional. Okay, I think that was all from the introduction. So now I'll go over chapter 12, which is the base objects or base types. Um, so why do we need this chapter? Well, in R, the term object gets used in two different ways. The first is everything in R is called an object. And the second is R has object oriented systems, S3, R6, S4. So we have this little Venn diagram where Everything in R is an object, but we have this um, separation of base objects from object-oriented objects. So they're mutually exclusive. The, and so these base objects are not object-oriented. Um, so no, the base types do not constitute an object-oriented object programming system. Um, the reasons why are that functions act differently on different types and they're handled in a switch statement, which is programmed in C. New types, new base types are impossible for application developers to create and rarely created by our core. So this was one thing that was confusing to me. Um, so just remember with object oriented objects, any developer should be able to specify a new behavior for a new class. So since we can't mess around in our core, it's not considered object-oriented system. How can you tell the difference between base and object-oriented objects? There's um, three ways in the book that's given an example. One is this is that object function. So this base vector returns false, whereas this data frame returns true. You can use this O type in the sloop package so the vector has a type of base and the data frame has a type of S3, or you can check if the attribute class is null. So for any base type, the attribute called class will be null, but it will be non-null for um, an object-oriented object. So diamonds has three classes, tibble data frame, tibble and data dot frame. Um, there are 23 base types listed in the chapter, although I know Hadley said 25. I was confused by this. If you count them, there's only 23. <laughs> um, and they're given the name in R and then the equivalent name in C. So I'm not, the, and then the broad categories are vectors, functions, environments, S4, language components, and esoteric. Um, if you look on the CRAN, there's also listed two previously withdrawn base types for internal and ordered factors. So maybe that's where the 25 comes from. And then um, an internal type, this chars XP to represent strings. And then the last bit was a side note about the numeric base type. So the base type numeric is sometimes used to mean the double type. In S3 and S4, it can either mean integer or double. And then if you use the function is that numeric, it will tell you if that object behaves like a number as opposed to whether their actual type um, is integer. No, is there any questions? Was that too fast? <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to like, I wasn't ever looking at you guys, actually. <laughs> uh, 
That was good, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I have a quick question. Yeah. So I don't have a lot of experience with this, but for those of you that do have experience with it, are you are you using this as a reference to like the, the C identifiers that they provide of like, this is what we call this in R versus this is what we call this in C? Um, Cause I know we've mentioned before how if you're like scaling up, sometimes it's very useful to do something in C instead of in R. It, does that make any sense or am I rambling? I imagine that might work if you are using uh, RCCPP or one of those systems that you do code in C or C++ and that that integrates with R because I have personally never used the C like uh, object names. Like never, I've never seen them before reading the chapter actually, so. We're doing 13 now? Yeah, I guess so. I can start and we can do like half of it. I have a demo, so hopefully we get to the demo. It's a funny one. Okay. Let's see. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Mm -hmm. So hello, um, my name is Roberto and I will be presenting chapter 13, which is uh, about S3, one of the object-oriented systems in R. Ooh. Okay, sorry. Um, so as an introduction, well, they had some statements about S3 that is R's first and simplest object-oriented system um it's the only system that it's used by base and stats package packages um it's commonly used in cram packages so if you are planning to uh, release packages into the cram or contribute then you might want to look into uh, all the details of s3 and become familiar with it it is very flexible but uh, i Thing, in my opinion, this makes it a little dangerous and you'll see why, because then you can do whatever you want with it uh, and even some silly stuff. And uh, one final thing is S3 won't check for correctness. So there is, there is now a well-defined uh, way to define an S3 object. And you'll see how we define those in a bit. Uh, one thing is, and hopefully some of you have done it, uh, you can check this uh, vectors package to get some hands-on experience with uh, S3. Because the chapter itself, it just give you, it gives you the details, but not many examples how you actually use it. Um, okay, so the basics. What are the requirements for an S3 object? So there's one requirement. You just need a class attribute. So if your object has a class attribute, then that makes it an S3 object. A simple example, it can be a factor that all of you are familiar with. Uh, and then you just define a factor. If you do type of the factor, well, it will be an integer. But then if you check the attributes, uh, you will see this new attribute class, which is a factor. This is just a string. So this simple thing makes it an S3 object. Uh, there is a command to drop the class, which is on class. And we'll see why we do that. So what makes them special? What makes this S3 object special? 
So the what makes it special is that when you pass an S3 object to a generic function, then based on the class of the object, it will behave different. So it will behave different if it's a factor. Uh, it will behave different if it's a string of characters or anything else. Um, so the classic example is print statement. And so how different it behaves uh, based on the class. And so here there's an example for print a factor. So it will print uh, the, these values, but what in reality is happening is that these are integers that are being mapped to the levels. So this is one, two, and three, which you can see when you do unclass that factor. So one, two, three, and then there's an attribute levels, but since there is no class, then it will just display the values and then the attributes. No special fancy uh, printing. Um, so how can you find out if a function is generic? So for that, we can use this loop, this loop package and f type. And the way you do it is this loop f type and then your function of interest. And if you see a generic string here, then that means that function is a generic. Um, I made this hopefully simple diagram uh, for you to kind of visualize how um, S3 objects and generics and the methods relate. So imagine you have different S3 objects with class one, class two, class three then in the middle you have the generic so that print that print function and that generic will dispatch uh, the method and so the method will be an implementation uh, for each of those classes so in the way their name are print or generic that class so print class one print that class two print that class three and there's this one, which is a special case uh, default, which is a pseudo class. And what that means is if uh, the generic cannot find a method, a generic method for the class of your object, then it falls back, it falls back to the default. Uh, you can track the method dispatchment with this loop S3 underscore dispatch and for example here for s3 print so print a factor this arrow means that's the method the generic method being dispatched so print that factor and but then also there is the print that default which in case uh, there was no a print that factor then it fall back to print that default and one thing that um, Hadley says is do not call uh, the generics directly. So do never to print that factor in your code. You should do print and then let the generic take, take care of calling the appropriate uh, generic method. And do let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, I had the exercises here. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you want to go through them, but I just wanted to point out that I, I thought this one was interesting because then you had a, a generic, which now it, it will be this as data frame, but then there is a generic method for that, for a class data frame. But the thing is, uh, given that um, generics and methods are separated by the dot, you could say that there is a generic as for a class data frame data frame so if you have an object with this class data frame data frame then you can say as in that object or as data and then an object of class frame data frame and so on and so forth so that's why you should not be using a dot uh, to name your classes you should use underscore and Hadley says also that if you are using a package, you should um, put in, as a prefix the name of your package. So 
that no one else messes up with your um, with your generics if they have the same names. And that happens, uh, for example, in the tidyverse that uh, you have the filter thing that is shared across packages. So sometimes uh, you have to specify um, which of those you want to, to use. Um, so classes, uh, two ways to create an S3 object. So you can create and assign the object using structure. So you do structure, um, the structure of your object, and then give it the class equals to whatever your class is called. And the one I use, I don't know if it's not a good, I, uh, a great idea to use this approach, but I like it. Uh, you create your object as you will do normally, and then you just give it the class, class uh, of the object, and then assign it. Uh, two handy uh, functions are to check the objects class, our class, that will return a vector of characters with every single class that belongs to that object. And then there's this one inherits, uh, you give it an object and then which class you want to check. So that will be a boolean. And I guess that will be handy if you are trying to work uh, with a particular object. So if you say if inherits this object, this class. Um, I found this very funny <laughs> that I want to stop you to share uh, your food. And I have an example of that actually. So, uh, so let's say for example, you have your simple linear model. So then you just do as you usually do. If you want to check the class of that, then you just do class and the object, and that's LM. Then you can print uh, that object. And then what's happening internally is that this print is calling print.lm, which internally it has, uh, I would say, I guess a, there's a paste somewhere where you concatenate what is the formula, and then you do uh, print the coefficients. So instead of printing that uh, list of uh, components that a linear model object is, because it's a list, then it shows you like a nice, uh, a nice message thing. But then uh, you could do a class and then something just random. And so that's when, when they refer like it's flexible, then this is what they mean by that that you can change the class of your object by something completely random. And uh, I won't complain. I won't tell you, oh, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. I will say, oh, go for it. You should know what you're doing. And then I don't have the print here, but what will happen is that it will print a list of each component of the linear model. No, like nice like summary of what's the formula and what are the coefficients. So you lose that by, by doing silly stuff like this. So please don't do that. Um, so how to avoid this awkward situations? Uh, Hadley recommends having three, the three following things. So a low level constructor, a validator and a user friendly helper. And he says uh, you should use this notation to name them. So a constructor with new underscore, the name of your class, a validator with validate underscore, the name of the class, and then a helper with um, just the name of your class. And these are functions. Um, the book says that you should always have the constructor and Always, I think this is new to me because I've been using S3 objects and I've never done a, a constructor. So I've been doing things wrong. Uh, and then a validator, it's a place where you do like checks that will be uh, time consuming or will require some resources. So you want to do that every single time. And then the, the helper is if you are allowing users uh, let's say you're using a package, so you want your users to create new objects. So then you uh, 
create a a helper with messages saying, oh, you should be using an integer or you should be using a a vector uh, double here and that kind of thing. See, here are examples of the construct of a constructor for a date time class. And so you see it takes two arguments. So X in it, um, then the simple check you should do in a constructor is uh, for example, check the type. So if it's not double, then it's stop. And then the units should match one of these uh, values. And then you create the object, give it the class, and then any additional attributes, you just add them. And then, uh, so here it creates a new object. And then what's happening here is internally, it's calling a print at diff time, and it's just, displaying nicely saying time difference of uh, the value and the units you gave it. Okay, uh, there's a validator example for a factor. So it starts by ex extracting the values. And then, well, for a factor, we have these attribute levels. And then we want to make sure, um, let's see what it is, that not all the values are missing. So we should have at least one value. And also that number of levels should be uh, at least the same as the, as the unique value we have. Okay. Then there's a helper function. Uh, for example, this one is for diff time. So this one will coerce the input to a double. So, Let's say you user just give it a integer number, but instead of saying stop, like uh, I'm not allowing doubles, then you should help the users to by parsing or coercing the that input to double. Um, then you could guess the levels from unique level values, and I think this is default. Yeah, this is the default uh, behavior factor. So you use the factor and then. Um, a vector and then it will guess what they are the unique levels and so it will it will get these levels for you automatically uh, then allow users to apply individual components for complex types so this is a timestamp and here we allow the user to pass the year month day hour minute seconds time zone as individual components and then we create a an object that find some more. Uh, here were the exercises, Oops, I was skipping. Okay, so how is the method dispatch method form? So magic, believe it or not. Uh, and so, well, not really, uh, so every generic uses, uh, it, it calls something called a function use method which it takes two things and I'll tell you in the next slide what it is. Uh, but then you don't pass any arguments to that. It will do it automatically for you in the background. So that's what it's kind of magic. It does things in the background for you. So it takes two things. Uh, it takes the name of the generic function, which is required. And then optionally, it takes the argument used for method dispatch. So what that means is you do use method and if you're creating your own print statement, so like print that my class, you can do inside that use method um, print. And so that will call the, the appropriate uh, generic. And then this one, the second one is optional, but then if you don't pass it, it will automatically get uh, the first object here. So the first up you give it to generic, it will pass it here. And based on the class of that, it will call the appropriate method. But how does it work? So in the background, what's happening is that it generates a vector of uh, methods. So you can picture it like this. So you have your object X with class Pikachu. And then what's happening is that it's generating a generic that Pikachu and then 
the generic that default. So it will fall back to that if, I don't know, you give it, create an object and then call it write you. So write you doesn't exist, it falls back to the default. Okay. Uh, so how do you find methods? Um, and this uh, package loop comes in handy here. Uh, if you do S3 underscore methods generic, you can find all the methods for a particular class. So I mean, no, sorry. For <laughs> you can you can find all the generics for a particular all the methods for a particular generic. So generic is mean, and so there is a mean that date mean that default, mean that diff time, and all this three. I think we're gonna come back to this quasi closure or something in some chapter later on. And then this is the one I was trying to describe before. You have a class and then you want to find which methods exist for that class. And so for class order, there's a state frame, there's a summary, there's real level, real level. And one thing that might be important is to check if it's visible, because I think this might, this is an internal one. So users might, might not have access to it. So another thing to keep in mind. Um, so creating methods. So before you start creating methods, you have to keep two things in mind. You should only ever write a method if you own the generic or, or, or the class. Hadley says that it's, it's rude to do it otherwise if you don't own the generic or you don't own the class. That he said that you should talk to uh, the developers to include that in their package. But I guess that might be hard because I think if, if you try to do a pull request to one of the tidyverse packages, you have to justify it properly why that must be included in that package. So that might not be too easy. Um, then a method must have the same arguments as it's generic. And the exercises, um, now I have a demo. Let's see how it goes. Do, do, and do, do. I have to hear my art session. Do let me know if there's any questions so far. No, all good. I didn't understand Hadley's like, check back to chapter six, why we have to repeat the name twice of my um, new, um, in that last section. Yeah. Um. Uh, my my new generic is a function use method my new generic and then it says if you wonder why we have to repeat my new generic twice think back to section 6.2.3 which is first class functions um, yeah i don't know i think i just skip <laughs> skip through that because i wasn't sure either um uh, I guess like it's because you might wonder why do I need to to call this if that's the exact name of my generic. So why can it take the this name down here? Maybe that's where where it's coming from. So I'm not sure to be honest. It's weird. I feel like it could because you can definitely like use match call and get the function name from the call and it mm. could like implicitly call it but maybe those that like functionality to do that did not exist when they wrote the internals of use method I don't know mm. it seems like they could do it at this point yeah that might be it uh, so like possible explanation okay let me go back any other questions <laughs> Okay, so that's one. And that's another one. Yeah, okay. So I 
created a small package, but I will show you the no package version because it's so it's tiny. Bad. Oh, so FYI, we see your whole screen right now. Yeah, uh, that's fine. You can actually zoom with the two finger thing on mobile. I don't know if you can do it on zoom on the computer, no. but I can zoom. Yeah, I can make it bigger. Just gonna make the window all the way. How about that? That yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. If not, I can zoom in one more time. <laughs> all right. So this is the no package version. And I can go back to the package if you want to later on. So I started by creating a constructor and I just call it new animal. And so this will take a name and it will take ice, which is just the number of ice, the animal. And then it does the simple checks. No, stop if it's not character, stop if it's not in here. We don't want one have ice. And I've seen that. So, and then we just do the structure, um, name, eyes, and then give it a name. And so, let's see, that's my environment. Yeah, that's my environment. So, that's the new constructor. But then I want to print the animal. So, I want a, this is my generic, and this is uh, the class. So, this is a method for the print. So what I'm saying is, okay, so I want to print, hello, this is X name, and I have this number of eyes. And this is just a little thing to add an S if it's not equal to one. And then um, somewhere in the book, it says that you should return invisibly when you do a print. I don't know what was the reason behind that, but I'm doing it anyhow. Okay, so that's a simple one. And then I have another one called a new fish, which adds, I only has a fin, fence uh, argument here, but then it has the dot, 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 which I'm matching to name and eyes. So this is not properly inheritance because I didn't really get it, get to how it worked but this is my take on it. And so I just say, I just match that this dot, dot, dot should be a length two. So if there's more than two things past here, then it will stop. And then if they don't match name and eyes, then it will stop as well. And so I said, this new uh, constructor will be of class fish. And then, but then it also is an animal that fish is an animal. And then I just do print dot fish. And this is something we haven't talked about yet. Maybe next week, I think, and we will have much time. But then what I'm doing is I want to call the print for the second class. So my first one is fish, but then I want to call the print for the one that follows. So next method, so the animal. So this is print that animal basically. And then here I just add a new line saying, I have this number of fins. And I did the same for swim. So swim and well, fish can swim for an animal. I'm not saying what kind of animal it is, but I'm saying it can't swim. So I'm just adding a default here saying I can't swim. And I will just create two objects, an object A and object B. And if I didn't assign that, if I move here in my console, hopefully you can see it, then you can say um, it will automatically print and that print will call the print that animal that I created. So hello, this is Dumbo and I have two eyes. And then I'm just using pur to, to get the side effect of this print and swim. But if you remember like A and B are two different classes. Well, A is animal and B is a fish, which is also an animal. 
And so if I run this, then it will call, hello, this is Zumbo and I have two eyes, this is Nemo and I have two eyes and two fins. And if I do the swim function, and I said, oh, Zumbo says, I can't swim. And then Nemo says, oh, I can swim. Yay. And so that was my very, very simple example. And I hope it makes sense because I mean, I, this, this might not be useful at all. And I will show you a bit one example that might be more useful. And so let me know if you have any questions. So I will have to make this bigger. Yeah. But how do you have 10,000 e unread emails? <laughs> <laughs> it's all <always> fun. <laughs> Most of my colleagues asking for help. Which uh, animals had 1.5 eyes? <laughs> That's a good question. That's what it's an integer. <laughs> um, so a more useful scenario of this thing of using uh, S3 classes, it will be, uh, I have this package called dabr or dabr. And so it's database I mean, it's management with R. It's just a simple, a silly package that I created for my group. So we deal with different databases. And then I thought it would be handy if we had a package that could deal with different, uh, different databases. So MySQL, um, PostgreSQL, SQLite, and that kind of thing. And so what I did is I have my generic here, for example, this is to close the connection. So when you connect to the database, you open a connection, but then you should always close your connection. Well, sometimes it times out, but you should close it. And so my generic is close connection. And so you see here, I do use method plus con, and then this con object. It doesn't have to be called X, you just call anything you want. And then there's the dot, dot, dot for any other uh, parameters. And then here I have one implementation, which is for a Maria TV connection. So for this particular connector, I know that I have to use this package. So I do R Maria TV, uh, colon, colon, db disconnect and the connection object. So the advantage of this is that, I don't know, let's say I have a connection object here. I'm just gonna call it, no, this might not work. Um, but then uh, that object will have a class. Let's see. Let's give a class to the object very quickly. And let's do this one, so it works. Maybe it won't work. So, oof. Uh, that's why. I think you can do an empty list. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's because it was null. So it works if it's in a number. See how flexible is this? It's an integer. Just a single number and then I could give it a class. So the thing is I could say dabber and then close con, and then I just pass my connection object, which this might filter an error. Yeah, because he doesn't know how to handle this uh, one single number. But then he called the appropriate, uh, the right um, generic method. And so now imagine that you have multiple connectors. So you have close con, uh, I don't know. SQL, SQLite, and then you have function, blah, blah, blah. And then you have here, I don't know, SQLite, and it's running our package, but you have like close. So to me, that's when I see the benefit of this. Was someone asking? No? Okay. And so, 
this whole package, which is actually in the current, so you can look for it. Um, I have methods to delete query, to run delete queries, to um, insert queries, to select queries, and all that stuff. And at this point, it only works with uh, our MariaDB, which is for my SQL, my, uh, no, SQL databases, my SQL database. And so it looks a bit weird, like, because then I have this special documentation for a package, but you can just ignore that. But yeah, that's that was my demo and a more practical and useful thing instead of the animals. For... Oh. Mm -hmm. I have a question because like some of those functions you have are already generics, right? So you had to redefine them and I don't like um, select and update are yes. already. So yeah, if I, if I do, for example, library uh, tapper, and then if I, you see here it says that it will, the following object is masked from the stats for the update. Uh, it masks the attributes and quotes. And I think if I load uh, dplyr, it will say something about select. Yeah, uh, let's see maybe. You see, the following objects are masked from this package. Mm -hmm. So the way you do in a package is uh, select. Let me find the select one here. So in the package, you just have to include this, the generic. So the generic, which is very simple because then you just need to put use method inside. Use method, the name of the generic, and then the object itself. And then when I define it, I just do select that my class. And then, so for example, here you see I have a quiet uh, parameter and they have my dot, 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 which are pieces of my query. So don't look at the code because it's messy <laughs> <laughs> and not well documented. But that's the idea with, uh, this. And I do have a package version of the animal class. If you want to see how it will look. So I have a question example, about the previous thing, mm -hmm. the, the Dabber package. Um, yeah. The, so your, your method there has arguments that the generic doesn't have. Um, mm -hmm. When somebody went to use the generic, uh, would those arguments show up in the like auto prompting from R Studio, or do they have to be in the generic to show up? No, so I can show you here. So if I do dabber, something's happening with my camera. So if I did this, you only show the connection object, but then. Um, I just put some documentation for the dot, 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 saying select query and optional parameters, but it doesn't say what's expecting. So here I have quiet, but it won't show it. Oh, uh, so it's, you, you want it hidden so you can use that for like debugging and stuff, or just somebody who knows that they can use that can use it, but it's not like front facing. Yeah, so I think the way it works is I would just add an example and say, oh, you can use this parameters because um, you see I have it here documented, uh, quiet for example, but then yeah. it won't come up when you do the documentation. And I mean, I could check the uh, see, select. So if here, if I do this one, this one has the, the parameter, but mm. then you shouldn't be calling that, you call the generic, which it will hide those. And I figure out a way to show them up. So that might be a thing to look for. It works, but then you have to give the user an example because then otherwise they won't know what other parameters they can pass to that generic. You could just add it to the generic though, right? 
ideally should you shouldn't you say at here like quiet like if you or in the actual function like Yes, you you have to add it to the documentation, but too, but couldn't you just add it there as to the generic? No, I think it complains. Uh, so if I was to say quiet here, for example, mm -hmm. um, let me do the build. But I think it will complain. Uh, yeah, you move on if it has to build, and we can see if it works or not. Mm -hmm. I think usually you just put it on the help page for the method. Yeah, I think um, it's over there, right? The thing is, when you when the documentation shows up, you see like uh, there's no separate documentation for the generic methods because then you're calling using this RD name, and they are all linked to the same one. So RD name select. For example, I cannot have a title for the generic because that how... title will overwrite the the generic, which I don't want. Weird. How do other? It looks like it works then? though. Because <clears throat> like predict, you can do like predict dot glm, and it has a help page. Mm. Let's see. <laughs> now I'm intrigued. So let's do see a help session, help session, help page. Okay, so can you see the help down here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it says select query, and then it says that there is an S3 method for class MariaDB. Oh, well, I mm -hmm. actually, mm, this shouldn't mm -hmm. be up here because I added. So <laughs> up there, you, you won't see the quiet. You just see the count that that. But yeah, mm -hmm. it shows up. You were right. Okay. Interesting. Okay. In the help, yeah. it's uh, what are the arguments? <laughs> so I guess if you want it to be in the auto prompter, it has to go in the generic. But if you just use the RD name and point them all to the generic, then it'll show the the sub methods and the arguments to them in the documentation. Like he gives me an error because I did the SQLite thing. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. So let's see. that's what I had up to the demo. And I think we can come back quickly to just the last couple of points next week, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. Because it's already 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. well, for me. That uh, I'm gonna ask more questions. So, <laughs> oh yeah, well, you can go ahead now and ask. No, I mean next week. All right. Um, but yeah, hopefully it wasn't too too fast and kind of makes sense. Makes sense. Now you can. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Torin and Roberto, for presenting today. No problem. See you guys next week. Okay. Bye. Bye, y'all. Take care. Uh,